Welcome to Because the Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles 24-8. I'm Allison. And I'm Erica. And before we start, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Stream us on Spotify or now even subscribe on YouTube. And if you're enjoying BC the Beatles, feel free to leave us a preferably five-star review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Yes, and also don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, and now TikTok. We'll be posting videos, photos, and more from this episode and beyond. And you can always email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. Hello, Erica. Happy New Year. We're back after the holidays. I know. 2024. I'm very excited. My God, how did we get here? Well, you got here after a couple of weeks doing Beatles stuff in the UK. (laughs) That's true. That's true. <laughs> yes. It was weird because that was like the last place I went before the pandemic. So, but yeah, so it was interesting to be back after that. And, um, but it was good. It was like 16 days in London and Liverpool. I went to Abbey Road again, got to go in the studios, got to have a cup of coffee in the canteen with a couple of the lovely ladies that work there. And I went to Studio One, which is the big studio. That's where they did the All You Need Is Love telecast and record a lot of the orchestral stuff. Hmm. So I'd never been in there. And that was really cool. It seems like a whirlwind now, but did lots of touristy things and had a little Christmas time over there as well. So it was good. So nice. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. Liverpool was very cold and very (laughs) rainy. And of course, I paid a visit to our lovely Brian, both Aww. his statue, and uh, I went to his grave, as I always do. And I have a little catch up chat with Brian. Oh, and um, I was texting you, Erica, but I turned around like twice on the bus because it was fucking like torrentially raining and I forgot my umbrella. And then it would clear up, the sun would come out and then I'm like, all right, I'm getting back on the bus because, you know, he's buried sort of like out in the suburbs, kind of. So it's not a haul to get there on the bus, but it's sort of like if you're halfway out there, you might as well go the whole way. So, yeah, I finally made it. It was fine. It was great. And then, um, yeah, sort of stuck around the city center, went to the Cavern Club for New Year's Eve. Lovely. Yeah, it was great. They had some acts. They had a Beatles tribute band play, uh, of course. And I got to say the John in that was probably the best John I've ever seen. Wow. Like in my many, many years of tribute band shit. Oh, I love that. I love that when they're so good and you can kind of get lost in that world. Yeah. He recreated the All You Need Is Love telecast coat that John really? wore. And I've never, ever seen a John do that. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was insane. And I saw another band uh, of younger guys who did the early, early Beatles. So hopefully would love to have one of those guys on the pod. They're called the Savage Young Beatles. So check them out. They are so cool. I love any band that does the early sort of like Hamburg, the leathers, like that kind of stuff. So good. Yeah, it's by far my favorite Beatles time period. So when somebody really gets into reenacting it, it's very cool. Definitely. But yeah, so now I'm back. How is uh, how's your new year so far? Oh, it's good. It's good. I got a lovely book today in the mail. Oh, did you? Yes, yes. My friend Allison, I don't know if you know her, she sent me Mm -hmm. one of Mary McCartney's new cookbooks signed by Mary McCartney. It was amazing. Yes. It was so amazing. Uh, That's so nice. Your friend Allison must be the best person ever. Yeah, she's really cool and she really knows her Beatles shit, which I really like. So. Well, I mean, if you're going to talk about this book, we need to talk about what we mutually got, what you mutually bought us for Christmas. (laughs) The best freaking gift ever. And you you guys, you listeners will love this. Yes. Remember David McGurk, who designs action figures, that some of them are Beatles related. Well, I decided that we both needed one and we both needed one of Brian. So for Christmas, I got Allison, the standard 1960s Brian, and I got the Brian in his stamp out the Beatles sweatshirt. So we have different (laughs) Brian's. To cheer us on as we record. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh my God. And I love it. I was freaking out. I opened the box and, you know, we talked to David too about his packaging, how he does, you know, the beautiful illustrations on his packaging. He does such an incredible job on these action figures. And I'm just so excited to have one. I'm so excited that you have one. 
I don't know. It's so awesome. I, it makes me happy every time I see it. It's on my bookshelf. It is. And I love seeing when he posts new stuff on Instagram, like the one that he did recently. He did Jimmy Nickel. And he did oh, Jimmy Nickel. Oh, I haven't Nickel. seen that yet. Oh, it was so cool because he did it all in black and white. Oh, that's so cool. I think maybe he told us he was going to do that, but maybe uh, I hadn't seen it. So I'll have to go look at that. That's so cool. I think he mentioned that he was going to do that originally with George Martin. So when that's right. it showed up in Jimmy Nickel. And so I tagged a uh, former podcast guest, Jim Birkenstadt, who wrote the yes. Beatle who vanished about Jimmy Nickel and he picked up one too. So he's got a, Oh, nice. He's got oh, an action figure awesome. as well. <laughs> We're all going to have these little action figures. If only we take them out of the box and we could play with them. I know. But, uh, Never. I know. But no, Brian's staying <laughs> in the box. Sadly, I wish, you know, if I had more cashola, I would buy two and then I could, you know, take one out of the box and we could reenact. Like, I know we talk about reenacting scenes from Scylla. If you made a Scylla black figure. Yeah, I want a Scylla, a Brian, a George Martin, and a Burke Bacharach, and I want to do the Alfie scene. <laughs> right? Oh, my God. I think about that all the time. I know. Just on a side note, so good. I need to rewatch Scylla. And you've seen the original video, right? Oh, yeah, of okay. course. Of course, yeah. So wonderful. Thinking about that now, I wonder which studio that happened in, because I feel like with the orchestra, that would have been Studio One as well, which I didn't even think about while I was in there. Uh, oh, I could have channeled that energy. Now you have another reason to go back to Abbey Road. Exactly. It's like I have some more energy I need to soak up. Absolutely. Well, I'm very excited about our show today. I know. I know. I think we just couldn't get enough after now and then of these new Beatles songs. So we're deciding to revisit some of the other ones, the other two that were part of the original anthology. They started work on it 30 years ago this month. That's crazy. I know. My God. Makes me feel old because it's one of the few things I remember like doing that's a new Beatles thing, but fine, whatever. See, I don't remember. I mean, that was before I became a Beatles fan in the year 2000. So I was a little bit post that, but I do remember I had the anthology on VHS, not to brag, but I mean, uh, lucky yeah. you. But yeah, no, I, I missed the whole telecast people talk about. When it launched, it was like, you know, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It was that exciting. Yeah. And I was really curious because I remember it, but it's been a very long time ago and I wasn't that old. So I wanted to kind of think about it in terms of what we just experienced too with now and then to try and see how these two things compare to each other. Oh, totally. But there are so many parallels there. Yes, so many. But for those people who also don't really remember the anthology. Let's talk a little bit about how Free as a Bird and Real Love became a part of this project. Yes, please can we? Yes. So the concept of recording more Beatles songs wasn't originally in the plans for the anthology project or for anything, really. Paul, Ringo, George, and Yoko had been in talks about a project like this since at least 1989. The definitive story of the Beatles told by the Beatles. It was almost as soon as all of the lawsuits cleared, they started thinking about the projects they could do together. But in reality, a project like this had been in the works since the late 1960s. Neil Aspinall, with the help of Mal Evans, started cataloging footage for a project they called The Long and Winding Road. Year after year after year, somebody was saying that it was imminent, but it never materialized. So crazy. Yeah. So the anthology kind of came from that. But when they really started planning for it in earnest, the three surviving Beatles were thinking about like, what new things can we do for the project? And they thought maybe some incidental music. They played around with it. They tried to approach it. They just, it wasn't right without John. It was, you know, it was just too weird and it wasn't the Beatles. So instead, they eventually hit on really what was a novel solution for the time that Yoko had some of John's demos that she was willing to give to Paul, George, and Ringo to finish. And all three of them liked the idea. Uh, George actually said, this became the perfect vehicle because we always had a thing between the four of us that if any one of us wasn't in it, we weren't going to get kind of Roger Waters and go out as the Beatles. So therefore, the only other person who could be in it was John. Suck it, Roger Waters. Yeah, but apparently this pact wasn't in place, I don't know, in 1969 when George walked out during the get back sessions and John was like, well, if he doesn't come back in a day or two, we'll just get Clapton and carry on. 
Yeah, maybe he, uh, that was George's way of being like the bigger person, say. Maybe. It's also possible George <laughs> just never heard that. I was going to say, like, it's, you know, that really wasn't, I mean, I don't remember ever hearing that before Get Back. No, me either. It must have been in, in the unreleased part. So, damn, if George didn't know that, savage. Good he didn't hear it. He's bitter enough during this time period. We didn't need that. It's true. It's true. <laughs> So in, you know, unanimous agreement, they approached Yoko with the idea to see what was available and if she was interested. And as always, and this is a running theme throughout the anthology, accounts differ. Or, about, yeah, throughout the Beatles history, really. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul and Ringo's story is that Paul contacted Yoko about the idea. And Paul said about this encounter, <laughs> she was a little surprised to get a phone call from me because we'd often been a bit adversarial because of the business stuff. She said she had these three tracks, including Free as a Bird. But Yoko has said that it was George with Neil Aspinall who first approached her about the idea of adding the new parts to John's demos. So different stories. Nonetheless, she liked the idea and... 30 years ago this month, on January 19th, 1994, Yoko gave those tapes to Paul on the night that he inducted John into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow, that's crazy. That's insane that she brought them to the ceremony. Yes, and she did clarify, though. She she did said, quote, it was all settled before then. I just used that occasion to hand over the tapes personally to Paul. And then she goes on. I did not break up the Beatles, but I was there at the time, you know. Now I'm in a position where I could bring them back together and I would not want to hinder that. It was kind of a situation given to me by fate. Wow. I never thought of it that way. No, I didn't either. And Yoko really could have just said hell no. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked to, you know, Gary Evans when we had him on the podcast with Ken Womack. And it's like Yoko at this time was so she just seemed very, you know, sort of benevolent about enhancing the Beatles history, like doing this, you know, making sure Mal's archives got back to the family, you know, and I don't know, she doesn't get that credit. She should. Yeah. I mean, she's behind the scenes. She's done a lot to further these legacies. Yeah. And it makes sense. Like she would give the demos over, like the demos would come from her for these tracks, but also it's like her heart was in the right place. It wasn't sort of like begrudgingly giving them to Paul because Paul wanted them. It was sort of like, okay, yes, like I'm going to do this thing to counterbalance what people think about me. I really like that part of the story. And I also like the part of the story that it wasn't Paul who originally approached Yoko, that somebody else led this charge. Yeah. So we got these tapes. Yoko handed them over. Neil Aspinall recalled that there were two cassettes of songs, possibly five or six tracks. And of course, allegedly, the words for Paul was written on one of them. Yes, which Giles could not confirm nor deny when uh, he <laughs> came on the pod. Nope. Even he hasn't seen it. <laughs> yes, even he. Well, those cassettes will surface one day. But what we do know is the tapes contain at least four songs, Free as a Bird, Real Love, Grow Old With Me, and Now and Then. And the first three had already been known to hardcore Lennon fans and bootleggers. They'd been released elsewhere. Free as a Bird was played like one time, like very few people knew it, but it was on the radio series, The Lost Lennon Tapes. And then one of the real love demos was on the 1988 soundtrack to the movie Imagine John Lennon. And of course, Grow Old With Me had been on John's posthumous album from 1983, Milk and Honey. So I think they decided that Grow Old With Me was already known enough that it wasn't worth working on it. And I can't imagine what it would sound like with the other three on it. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a John and Yoko song. It does not yeah. feel like a Beatles song. The words, it doesn't feel right to yeah. have John and Paul sing it. I mean, unless we're really leaning hardcore into McLennan. <laughs> we're not. Uh... <laughs> we're not. We're not. <laughs> we're not. But no, I, I agree. I think the other two, definitely, for sure, those are more beatly. Yeah, yeah. And we don't know too much about the songs themselves. We do know they've been recorded in 1977, John at his white piano at the Dakota. The speculation that the inspiration for Free as a Bird was either less plausibly John found a drawing of a bird that Julian <laughs> made with the words Free as a Bird written on it, or... Probably more plausibly, but who knows? John wrote it once he got his green card after all those years of struggle with U.S. immigration. That fits the time. John seeing one of Julian's drawings at that time does not fit. He just didn't no. see Julian. 
And Julian was a little older. You know, he wasn't his Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds period anymore. And as you say, it's like they were kind of estranged. I just think people love to tie a legend onto a, a Julian drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Julian was like was 16. I, don't I know. Think it's like he's not first. making a freaking crayon drawing at this point. <laughs> I don't think he's he's a little busy with like teenage stuff. Hearing John again was a super emotional experience for Paul, George and Ringo. And the prospect of recording with him, even in this disembodied way, was kind of a hurdle. They they had to address it before they could get to work. They thought, you know, it was weird. It was creepy. It was gave them the chills like it was strange. And Paul did come up with this idea. He said, it's crazy, really, because when you think about a new Beatles record, it's impossible because John is not around. So I invented a little scenario. He's gone away on holiday and he's just rung us up and he says, just finish the track for us, will you? I'm sending the cassette. I trust you. That was the key thing. I trust you. Just do your stuff on it. I told this to the other guys and Ringo was particularly pleased with this. (laughs) And Ringo added, at the beginning, it was very hard knowing we were going in there to do this track with him, meaning John. It was pretty emotional. He wasn't there. I'd love John. We had to imagine he'd just gone for a cup of tea, that he's gone on holiday, but he's still there. That's the only way I could get through it. Oh, I mean, that's lovely. That's kind of a a nice way to think about it because I imagine that would be really still pretty fresh you know it was only about 15 years since John had been murdered you know I'm sure yeah it brought up a lot of trauma oh for sure and to hear something new to you yeah because for sure Paul wasn't aware that any of these songs had been out on bootlegs he didn't know so he'd never heard them before so Yeah. yeah that's that must have been really chilling yeah for sure So all three listened to them and they agreed that Free as a Bird was the song to start with. I think this is a very funny quote from Paul. He says, (laughs) I fell in love with Free as a Bird. I thought I would have loved to work with John on that. I'd like the melody. It's got strong chords and it really appealed to me. Ringo was very up for it. George was very up for it. I was very up for it. I actually originally heard it as a big orchestral 40s Gershwin thing. But it didn't turn out like that. Oh my Often God. your first vibe isn't always the one. <laughs> you go through a few ideas and then someone goes bloody hell and it gets knocked out fairly quickly. In the end, we decided to do it very simply. Oh, my God. I could never hear it that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine what John would say? Just granny shit. It's gone through my mind. Yep. He would hate it so much. <laughs> I bet George didn't love that idea either. Okay. So going back to what Paul said before about John being on holiday sending set and saying, I trust you, Paul, Mm -hmm. he wouldn't trust you to do that. All right. That's not what he would (laughs) meant. (laughs) You want to destroy that trust? (laughs) Oh, my God. Even 90s John would be like, this is horseshit, Paul. So good that they moved on. Yes, very much so. (laughs) So, of course, what we know now from now and then is the technology has really evolved since the Beatles did the anthology, but it was a very, very real problem when they were trying to put together Free as a Bird and Real Love. And of course, being just a demo, it wasn't played to a click track. So the tempo was varied throughout and it was really, really hard, if not impossible, to overlay the instruments on top and keep time. And of course, John had most of the lyrics, but the bridge was interspersed with nonsense syllables because he was still working them out. And to add insult to injury, the tape itself was also really poor quality. There was a lot of hiss and the vocal and piano parts were on the same track, which was primarily the problem that Peter Jackson sought to solve with Now and Then and successfully did that. But for Free as a Bird, it was a huge hindrance and the technology in the 90s just wasn't there. And so to help solve these problems and kind of bring the recording into the 90s and sort of use the technology that was available to them, they looked to find a producer and they decided on Jeff Lynn, who was a former member of the Traveling Wilburys with George. He was obviously the ELO frontman, produced for Tom Petty. I mean, he had a very long resume and he was very much in vogue at that time to coming out of the 80s. And of course, a couple of years later, he would work with Paul a little bit on Flaming Pie. Yeah. And that was an interesting choice. Interesting yeah, sure. because where the fuck was George Martin? <laughs> where was George? <laughs> I went down a rabbit hole with this particular question. It was driving me nuts. And I found out a lot of interesting things. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. 
So here again is where there's more than one version of the answer to this question, where was George Martin? Paul implied in an interview that George turned the job down. Paul said, George wasn't involved. No, I was originally keen to have George do it. I thought it might be a bit insulting not to ask him to do this. But George doesn't want to produce much anymore because his hearing's not as good as it used to be. He's a very sensible guy. And he says, look, Paul, I like to do a proper job. And if he doesn't feel he's up to it, he won't do it. It's very noble of him, actually. Most people would just take the money and run. Noble. How condescending. Uh, okay. So <laughs> that wasn't George Martin's recollection. Oh, According so to George, he was never asked. So he was never asked. And he says, but he says, quote, I'm not at all unhappy about it. I mean, the Beatles are very good record producers and they don't need me anymore. They wanted to keep this project down to themselves as much as possible. I knew about it. I knew that it was happening and there was no rancor about it. In any case, I'm now quite old and I don't mm. want to spend the rest of my life in the recording studio. It takes too long to do things now. And there are so many other things I'd rather be doing. I didn't want to do this anyway. It sounds really sad. They don't yeah. need me anymore. I'm quite <laughs> old. Okay. But George was clearly still working. Yes, he was having some hearing problems, but he was still working. He was not old. He was only 69. Oh my God. And he was producing the three gigantic anthology albums that went on alongside this project and obviously went on to work with Paul and Jeff Lynne and Flaming Pie just two years later. I mean, he was working all the way up until the Love Project in 2007. So he wasn't, he wasn't retired. No, he was still present there. I mean, yeah, he was arranging, not even just producing, like he was doing all that other kind of ancillary stuff around the recordings. Yeah, he was Ugh. composing, he was touring, he was traveling, not not just for the Beatles, like for all different types of projects. He was still very active. Yeah. So there's these two versions of the story. George Martin gave his opinion on it much later in a 2013 interview with Rock Seller magazine. George was asked if the Beatles asked him to produce the new anthology songs at that time. His response was, this is funny, quote, I kind of told them I wasn't too happy with putting them together with the dead John. I've got nothing wrong with dead John, but the idea of having dead John with live Paul and Ringo and George to form a group, it didn't appeal to me too much in the same way that I think it's okay to find an old record of Nat King Cole's and bring it back to life and issue it. But to have him singing with his daughter is another thing. So I don't know. I'm not fussy about it, but it didn't appeal to me very much. I think I might have done it if they asked me, but they didn't. Oh, my God. Dead John. I've got nothing wrong with dead John. It's such oh a crazy God. quote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with him, though, about the Nat King Cole, Natalie Cole thing. I always thought that was very weird. It is weird. And I can understand why knowing John... That would feel really fucked up and he wouldn't be able to get over the hump of that. Yeah. Yeah. So for many, many, many reasons, George Martin and these new Beatles songs, it wasn't a great fit. Also, apparently having Jeff Lynne produce was one of George's conditions for participating at all. So there's that. Uh, okay. Well, that explains a lot. Yeah. So once they got the technology working, once the tempo is smoothed out, the rest of the process was kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, really. So they had to add more lyrics. They had to add instrumentation and harmonies that complemented John's demo. And they had to really, truly make it a Beatles song, but without sort of distorting John's original idea or making it sound too much like, you know, the brainchild of any one Beatle. It had to be really cohesive. The nice thing was it sort of allowed for a lot of input from different angles and experimentation. Some things they did, they added to the middle eight where John hadn't provided the words and they augmented the original piano vocals with electric and acoustic guitars, bass, double bass, harmonium, harpsichord, drums, ukulele, backing vocals. I mean, just so much. They threw the kitchen sink at it, which, you know, the goal was to make it sound very Beatlesque. And Jeff Lynne, of course, being a musician himself, added some guitar, piano and backing vocals. But they did make a point of staying away from modern recording techniques. They wanted to keep it very of the time and keep it kind of toned down, which is good because it sort of adds to like a timeless, it's not dated. And a total 180 from now and then. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it totally shows different approaches. And of course, here we go. <laughs> uh, you know, it wouldn't really be a musical reunion with Paul and George 
without an argument. <laughs> and, you know, it's really funny because thinking about now and then again, they had disagreements over the guitar solo, which on now and then you got Paul playing the guitar solo in tribute to George. And they also bickered about the new lyrics. And Paul has said that in the end, that helped make the song stronger. That's one thing about Paul that I think when people denigrate him for taking charge and charging forward with what he wants to do, I think everyone knows and he knows that when he has a challenger as a partner, he's just such a better version of himself. And he knows it. You know, Elvis Costello in the late 80s, it was kind of a similar thing. Like they just challenged each other because they were both on that level. And I think you can hear that in Free as a Bird, too. Totally. And that's what made Flowers in the Dirt such a, you know, it's a polarizing album, but it is one of Paul's stronger albums because of the Mm -hmm. Costello connection. And yeah, I think Paul also writing that middle eight, I think there was maybe some virtual sort of challenge of making it John, but not to John, you know, him, but not to him. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting experiment in that kind of way, too. One thing that is really, really cool is that Bree's Bird is not just credited to John or to Paul or to either of them or them together. It was actually credited to Lennon McCartney, Harrison and Starr. The only other two songs with that credit are Flying, which is, of course, instrumental. (laughs) And Dig It, which, of course, is not actually a real song. <laughs> Come on, those are both in everybody's top ten. Really? Yeah, of course. Dig It? No, of course not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Most people don't even know Dig It. Oh, my God. I really, I really <laughs> bought it for a sec. I mean, it's certainly, I don't know where those ranked on our um, order of every Beatles song ever that we did a couple of years ago. As funny as it is, I, I have that open on one of my tabs. Do you really? <laughs> I really do. Oh, my God, that's amazing. So on yours, Dig It came in as number 201 of 211. <laughs> oh, my God. Where, where did it come in on mine? I can't even find it. It just fell off. Nope. Mine is actually quite high. It's 71. I don't what? understand that. I don't oh my understand God. what happened there. I'm going to say that's a fluke to preserve your dignity on that one. That's got to be a fluke. That, that's got to be a fluke. It should be <laughs> way down. That's so funny. (laughs) Oh, my God. I, you know, I don't mind flying so much, though. Flying's okay. It's okay. It's just not something I think about. Yeah. I mean, it's just funny. Those are the two with the four credit. Like, you know, come on. I know. It tracks, but it's hilarious. So we have Freeze the Bird credited for, but Real Love is credited only to John. That one was a lot more finished. And that's interestingly the only Beatles song credited to only one Beatle, much to Paul's chagrin. <laughs> yeah, there's no way he could just be like, "Well, this one's Lennon McCartney." Yeah, exactly. It's either John or it's everyone. Yeah, hundred percent. But one of the cool things about Freeze a Bird musically that I think is actually one of the things people think about the most when they think of the song is the quintessential Beatle moment at the end, which is George playing the ukulele with an eerie backwards recording of John. It's the 15 second second ending played forward. It's John saying turned out nice again from one of the demo tapes. The phrase is an homage to George Formby, uh, who was a Northern English comedian from the 30s and 40s. And he was also known for playing the ukulele. And I believe the instrument that George is playing is like a banjo lately. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, It's sort of a hybrid between a banjo and a ukulele. So yeah, so forward, it's John saying, turn out nice again. But backwards, it sounds like he's saying made for John Lennon, which I always thought he said something, something John Lennon. Me too. I didn't know exactly what any of that was until I started doing research for this. And that's freaky. Yeah. How the fuck does it sound like John Lennon? You know? I know. And it apparently was on one of the demo tapes. So it was something that was already like it was supplied with the 1977 Yoko tapes. It wasn't like they just found something from the Beatles archives. That's so crazy. Yeah. And none of the three solo Beatles use things like backwards tapes in there. So that was, they were unearthing an old Beatles musical trope and yeah. it came out sounding like made for John Lennon. That's so wild. Ooh. I mean, it's, it gives me chills. It's yeah, so freaky. <laughs> oh my God. It's so freaky. Uh, well, wrapping up the recording on these songs, they were recorded at 
Paul's recording studio in Sussex, and there's footage that made it into the anthology film and also the now and then short film. And I think like Erica touched on in the beginning, it's like it was weird for them at the start, but it became a really magical experience. Paul said it was like he, meaning John, was in the next room. You know, fuck, I'm singing harmony with John. It's like an impossible dream. And George, (laughs) George, we love George. We love George so much. George, staying true to his form, said, I hope someone does install my crap demos when I'm dead, making them into hit songs. Jesus Christ, George. (laughs) George also loved referring to this project as, quote unquote, free as a turd. (laughs) I mean, at least it was clever. He called now and then fucking rubbish. He didn't even have time to make it cute. Uh, Yeah, exactly. He's like, this song sucks. (laughs) Oh, my God. I we love. George's acerbic wit. Maybe that should be our our next George episode. We should talk about like his saltiest moments. Oh my God. I love Salty George is my favorite George. <laughs> Me too. I love that. I think it'd be so fun. Yes. And then we need to do at some point a, you know, a drunk 70s Ringo episode because that's my favorite Ringo. We need to do like episodes that are dedicated to our favorite eras of, of yes. before. God, I have so many favorite Paul areas. It's hard to pick one. I know. I know. Paul had a lot of really good evolutionary moments. I mean, I we could talk about his barefoot era with Heather Mills, you know, and the that's, driving that's rain. That's your favorite Paul moment? <laughs> no. Just just, like, just, saying just like his could... feet. No, Hell no. Oh, my God, gross. <laughs> Who am I, Quentin Tarantino? <laughs> I don't know. I Heather Mills did. That's why he never wore shoes in that era. I know. Anyway. So Free as a Bird was first played in the U.S. on Sunday, November 19th, 1995 on ABC as part of the first installment of the three-part anthology documentary. So it was on three weekends in a row, the middle weekend being Thanksgiving. So there was a lot of hype about it. And then finishing just in time for the Christmas buying season. Perfect. And the single was released two weeks later. It hit number two on the UK charts and stayed on the US charts for 11 weeks, peaking at number five. The reviews were pretty mixed. I was referred to as gimmicky, dreary, and a dirge by some members of the press. But of course, others were just thrilled to have anything at all that we could call New Beatles material. It then went on to win, though, the 1997 Grammy for Best Pop Performance by a group or duo with vocals validation yeah definitely and just to round out my uh treatise on george martin's participation in free (laughs) as a bird here's george martin's thoughts on this he said i thought what they did was terrific it was very good indeed i don't think i would have done it like that if i had produced it (laughs) backhanded the reporter goes on to ask him what would you have done he says They tried to put it into a rigid beat so they could overdub easily other instruments. So they stretched it and compressed it until it got to a regular waltz, and then they were done. The result was, in order to conceal the bad bits, they had to plaster it very heavily. So what you ended up with was quite a thick, homogenous sound that hardly stops. There's not much dynamic in it. Damn. The way I would have tackled it, if I had the opportunity, would have been the reverse of that. I would have looked at the song as a song and got the Beatles together and say, what can we do with this song? Bearing in mind, we have got John around as well somewhere. I would have actually started to record a song and I would have dropped John into it. I wouldn't have made John the basis of it. So where possible, I would have used instruments probably. And we would then try and get his voice more separate and use him for the occasional voice. So it would become a true partnership of voices. Whether that would be practical or not, I don't know. This is just theoretically the way I would tackle it. That's so interesting because he's basically describing the Mal machine and what Peter Jackson did now and then. (laughs) I also want to be like, George Martin, you haven't thought about this at all, have you? You haven't spent sleepless nights thinking about what you would have done for free as a bird? No, he didn't have, you know, an entire treatise ready for a reporter asking a question (laughs) off the cuff. No, no. He's like, now that you mention it. (laughs) <laughs> grab the mic let me just tell you <laughs> oh my god i love it but you know i would have been really interested to know how that would have been because i think and we can talk about this at the end but if i have any concerns about any of these songs it's that there isn't as much spontaneous product from the other beatles so interesting thoughts on it yeah 
The anthology project, having come just on the heels of the Live at the BBC recordings, reignited Beatles fandom after it had been out of fashion for a lot of the 70s and the 80s. There were a lot of reasons for this. First off, it gave something new to everyone to experience together. And certainly this is one thing that I remember watching it with my dad. We all got to hear a new Beatles song at the same mm-hmm. time, and we got to do that again with Now and Then. It's, it's just a really cool, amazing idea. It played, obviously, into nostalgia for first-gen fans and the videos. You know, they really played into it. Another thing it did, which is amazing, it made all these rarities and bootlegs accessible to everyone. Because in the pre-internet era, you'd have to be, like, spending all your time and money hunting down bootlegs and, you know, Dutch recordings or whatever. They called it to get any of these alternative recordings. The internet wasn't old enough to have that available to anybody who wanted it. And then I think that probably ignited a lot of scholars and and people who started thinking about the Beatles more as like a historical study because you had all of these historical sound documents now in the anthology. For sure. All of our podcasts about the Beatles are, you know, just one step in the pipeline that probably started with them releasing all of these things like this. Oh, for sure. And I mean, it really got the ball rolling for at least the rest of the 90s into the 2000s. And I'm thinking specifically about the one album, you know, and that I'm sure could trace its roots directly back to the anthology. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, it really does. Like there is basically a direct line from the technology and the experimentation needed to create Free as a Bird through one one plus for the love show and now up to the recent giles martin remixes of especially revolver and the early stuff off of the red album yeah and free as a bird and real love were actually part of the first set of giles's remixes as part of the one plus blu-ray set from i think 2000 oh, right. 2001 But it was weird. It's really weird because it's only on the One Plus. So it's only on the Blu-rays. It's not on the audio only version. So you can only find the original audio only. And Hmm. you can find these as as videos. And they're different. They both clean up John's vocals more. But Free as a Bird actually uses a different take of George's vocal solo, where he replaced the lyric, whatever happened to the life that we once knew with whatever happened to the love that we once knew. So it's so different. Weird. Yeah. And then Real Love, it, it added some elements that were there in the beginning, but were you know taken off for the final mix in 1995, such as some lead guitar phrases, some drum fills. It also brings out more of like the harpsichord harmonium. So it's, it's a bit of a different experience, but they're not that accessible or that well known. Hmm. So, you know, I, I think now, now, especially that we have now and then we have John's voice so clear. It's time to go back to them with the mal technology. Yeah. And I, you know, if I have one criticism about the brand new red and blue remixes, it's I just so much wish they would have included at least free as a bird on the blue album. Yeah. If they're going to include now and then it's like that would just been such a perfect link. And that would have been so great to hear a new Giles remix of free as a bird. My only thought about that is that they're probably going to do a 30th anniversary anthology push next year. Oh, I hope so. That would be amazing. So maybe they held them back for that reason, because otherwise there's absolutely no reason not to at least, even if they don't want to do another remix, like they used some of the One Plus stuff for the Blue Album, they could have right. at least put it on as far as, you know, tracing the lineage of the Beatles, but I don't know. I only hope you're right, because that would be an amazing campaign. It would be so great to have a bunch of stuff come out around the anthology's 30th anniversary. Yeah, and I feel like they're a little kind of cagey when people ask about it. So I feel like it's, it's happening. The work. Yeah, it's got to be. <laughs> I hope gotta so. Be. Oh, my God. Fingers crossed. Everything crossed. That'd be so great. One of my favorite things to do with Freeza Bird is the video. And the mm-hmm. video is so iconic. It's so cool. I remember seeing it for the first time, just having my mind blown. And the history is pretty interesting, too. So the video is directed by this guy named Joe Pitka, and he is primarily known as a commercial director, and he's produced over 5,000 ads in his career, uh, including spots for McDonald's, Pepsi, and the NFL. One thing that I thought was really interesting is he's also credited with the iconic frying egg, uh, this is your brain on drugs ad. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, come <laughs> on. Talk about iconic. Oh. 
Wow. Voice of our childhood. Just say no. I know, right? <laughs> Just say no. Nancy Reagan. What? Yikes. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, music video wise, he directed Michael Jackson's Dirty Diana and the Way You Make Me Feel videos. So and among others, among others. So he had a pretty storied career coming into the Free as a Bird project. And what Joe said is that Neil Aspinall played the track for me on a tabletop blaster. So this is in London. This is Paul's office. And Joe says, it sounded terrible. <laughs> uh, he said, we chatted a bit and Paul told me uh, his idea for the video. It consisted of a flip book revisiting the Beatles through old photographs. I lied and said that it sounded interesting. <laughs> Neil also said that they had a huge inventory of photographs that had never been seen. Side note, um, what photographs are these and have they been seen? Mm, we've probably seen them by now. Eh, maybe, maybe. Back to Joe. He said, OK. Paul also said that he was producing a film about the Grateful Dead using photographs that Linda had taken. And that technique looked promising, meaning the flip book technique. Then they showed me a video that Paul had produced of some other of the other song, Real Love. Joe says, it was terrible. And I bit my tongue. God. So, you know, he did his diligence. He tried to work on the flipbook concept that Paul came up with, but he's like, it just was not coming together. Um, and he hated it. He really just hated that concept. He later proposed having a sparrow fly through the Beatles. You're kind of taking that, um, you know, the bird imagery quite literally by having a sparrow fly through the Beatles history. Neil was like, no, because primarily for the reason that Beatles would never agree on the type of bird. <laughs> That's a crazy reason, but he's so right. He's so right. Neil knew it, knew them too well. He just called it. The thing I love about this, though, is that we have so many people who are there originally involved in the Beatles still. So we have Neil. He was still alive at this point. And Derek Taylor is still in the mix, which I love so much. Wow. Um, we need to do a Derek Taylor episode, Zybar. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, so Derek Taylor is still hanging around and he was listening to all of these ideas bubble up and it really inspired him to write this very long tone poem. And it was about the history of the Beatles. It used this bird concept sort of soaring through their lyrics and their songs and just like kind of um, images that would pop up in his mind, like visuals of what these songs were about. And Joe has a great website and he tells every detail of the story of coming to the free as a bird project. He also has scans of this, this note, this memo from Derek Taylor. So we'll drop them in our stories. And if you guys are listening to this later, we'll archive the note under the episodes highlight thing on Instagram. So you can take a look, but Derek's poem involved a lot of little references. So for example, under across the universe, he calls it spiritual, whatever. <laughs> Which I thought was great. <laughs> a Hard Day's Night, he says, the image of jumping about George is a powerful image. And Glass Onion, he says, anything glass is a thing of beauty. It's interesting to see his sort of interpretation of the different yeah. songs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really cool, it's worth a read. Anyway, something I love that Joe is doing at the same time as the Free as the Bird video was he got involved in uh, working on the movie Space Jam, My Childhood, what? similar na, 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 na. yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up actually getting some of his space jam colleagues involved and he you know he brought in another guy to kind of work on the storyboards and another guy who was a great animator to spearhead that aspect of it and then when it came time to actually shoot it he used a steady cam to shoot most of it um, including the car crash scene green screens all this sort of new technology for the time like he used a green screen to incorporate a sheepdog in a graveyard, referencing, mm. of course, Martha, Paul's sheepdog. And then he used something called an Aki crane for shots like the overview of the Abbey Road crossing. So he, you know, really employed a lot of techniques. And so Joe says, we were editing in London while we were still shooting the last parts of the piece. Paul McCartney visited and made the comment that the film seemed to run out of gas after 30 seconds. It was the Ooh. same comment that he made months before. I said that it would gain momentum after we put the archival footage of the Beatles in. And that comment seemed to satisfy Paul. I guess he didn't see the sarcasm in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his only request was to re remove some girl from a scene and a nurse that was exiting the bakery. He caught the reference to Mother Mary and didn't like it since Mother Mary was reputed to be his mother. 
Maybe they should have put in Brother Malcolm. Yeah, right? Exactly. Where's Mal? Come on. <laughs> Mal is in real love. He is. Yeah, that's true. They should have just, you know, stuck him as a little Easter egg and free as a bird. No. And then Ringo, meanwhile, his only request was to add an elephant. Of course. Uh, George predictably wanted a sitar. Mm -hmm. And Joe says, I went back to California to film Ringo's elephant and the other bits and pieces that were easier to do back there. And he said that everything had gone at least as smoothly as could be hoped for being involved with the Beatles. So that was great. So Yoko also approved the video. She really liked it. She did say the first draft was maybe a little bit more artistic, but she liked the final product too. She meant his first draft though, not Paul's flip book yes, idea, right? Yes, Joe, okay. Joe. Yeah, Joe's first draft, not Paul's flip book <laughs> uh, that Joe hated. Yes. But Joe did end up calling it, working on it, um, you know, quote unquote, the privilege of a lifetime, which you can only imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, to add to their Grammy wins for Free as a Bird, it won the Grammy for Best Short Form Music Video in 1997. So suck on that, Paul. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Paul. I love you. That's fantastic. But the only one who loses out here again is George Martin. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, I had also found something where he had said, oh, I really should have done it because then I would have had 30 number ones instead of 29. Oh my God. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. I didn't expect this to, like, turn into a George Martin episode, but I'm really excited that it took this turn. I have always loved George Martin, but I feel like I'm the verge of obsessed with him after this research. Hilarious. I always felt like that Brian is to me, like, George is kind of to you. Like, he your is. George love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> George is fucking great. I mean, we talk about how salty George Harrison was, but... George Martin was like classy salty. He was like just acerbic. It's so good. There's so much to celebrate from this episode in George Martin. So that's the story of Free as a Bird and Real Love. What did you think revisiting these songs, especially in the context of us recently getting Now and Then? I always loved Free as a Bird. I disagree with people who call it a dirge. Like, fuck off. I, I don't know. I remember when Anthology came out, or when I discovered Anthology, I should say, which is later. And I thought Free as a Bird was fantastic. And Real Love is okay. It's fine. But Free as a Bird, I thought kicked ass. Hearing it now does sound a little archaic, just because, you know, we're spoiled with the technology of now and then. But yeah, you know, I didn't really know much about the genesis of it until we started searching this episode. Um, so that was really interesting. And I still love Free as a Bird. And again, really hoping for a remix of that at some point. Yeah, definitely me too. You know, the reason I had our Beatles song list up on a tab was because I wanted to see if the song had charted for us and where. Yours hmm. didn't include it at all. I think you really unchecked because you had the option to uncheck the anthology. Oh, shit. Yeah. So yours wasn't there. It was for me, it was number 17. Wow. That was really high. That's so high. And I kind of get it. Yeah. Tell me why it's rated so high for you. I think for all of us, I think especially those second gen fans, like some of the reason we have unusual favorites, I think is because of when they were done and how we were able to interact with them as they came out. Like, I really like Flowers in the Dirt more than I probably should because I associate it with when I first, first became a Beatles fan. And I know you have a very special affinity for Driving Rain. Maybe that has yes. similar roots, you know? And I feel like Free as a Bird was the first and I thought only new Beatles output that I had ever seen. You know, they did a really big marketing campaign for it. It was huge that year, you know, it was something that, you did during Thanksgiving weekend. Like, I very clearly remember me and my dad, like, leaving the room with family Thanksgiving for this because it was it was appointment television. You know, it was still like we didn't have another copy of it. You had to watch it then. And that's what you did. Yeah. So I think that that's part of it. But also when I hear it, I think that of these three songs, it was the most at home as an original Beatles song of the three. Yeah. Like the way George's guitar comes in so strong, the kind of eerie effect on John's voice fits in with his sort of Strawberry Fields Forever period, the way he was masking his voice a little bit. You know, Paul's and George's 
middle eight, even the little things like the way Paul sings the full version of the middle eight and George only sings 50% of the middle eight <laughs> the second time around. Like it's just everything about it just feels like a Beatles song. And of course that false ending and that made for John Lennon piece Wild. at the end. It feels so complete. I think if if it was on Abbey Road, I don't think people would balk at it if they didn't know as long as it was, you know, remixed. Real Love, on the other hand, it just sounds so much like double fantasy to me. Like it's, it's yeah. you know, late 70s John. Everything about it is late 70s John. And I think they were right to not credit anybody else because they didn't do that much to it. And I, I kind of understand it. I mean, out of all of these demos, Real Love was actually one that John really liked. Like he did at least six other versions of it. He changed the title of it from real love to real life at some point. Like he he was working on this one. He liked it. Do you think it would have come out in some actual release context had John lived? I don't know. Like I'm kind of surprised it wasn't on Milk and Honey. But yeah. maybe that's that's only because it wasn't finished enough for Yoko to be able to do anything with it. But mm. I've never heard whether she had said what John's intentions were for this. But whatever it was, like he was really in his solo John groove when he was doing this. Like George Martin had said about it, I think that it would have been really interesting to have allowed them an exercise to deconstruct the demo more. And, you know, possibly emotionally, psychologically, they just could not do that anyway. Like it would have been impossible yeah. to, you know, fuck around with John's song. But I wish George Martin had been able to do something with it. And I would have loved to hear how he would have done it because... I think hearing Real Love as more of a Beatles song would have been interesting. For sure. I mean, and that could have been one where, you know, not that Paul could have gone full granny shit on it, but like add some sort of orchestral elements, which, you know, they sort of do, with, but it's a bit more synthesized, you know, in Real mm -hmm. Love. But that could have been something where George Martin really could have shined. Seriously. I think, again, too, one of the highlights was that for both of these actually were the videos. Mm, um, I mean, for the sure. Freya's Bird video is a masterpiece. And if you look at just how how the green screening was done, how the editing was done, they use techniques even for 1994. Like it doesn't look old in the way that like, I don't know, like Ebony and Ivory looks old. <laughs> like it doesn't look like antiquated techniques that you wouldn't use anymore. It looks artistic. Yeah. Things like like the dog running across the graveyard or like that clip of George walking into Abbey Road Studios, but it's made to feel like it's part of the Liverpool flying through scene. They've done so many things and there's so many little Easter eggs to pick up, like the kids walking down the street and they've got pig heads on for piggies. Like there's yes. so many different weird things. And they were able to find those, by the way, those were props. They weren't photo, not Photoshop, but you know, like any sort of proto Photoshop like that was actually shot like that. Oh, wow. That's cool. Which is so interesting. Yeah. Freeze the Bird, you can watch it over and over and over, speaking from experience. It's just, it's addicting and it does hold up like technologically. Yeah, I think it does. And all three of these videos, they have this theme of looking to the past and real love does very much what now and then did in that it's combining them from different times. Mm, yeah. There's even a couple of times where they matched John from other periods singing the word love. So it looked like he was singing along with the song. That's right. Yeah. It's funny. I think I felt about real love, probably that people who live through the 60s feel when they see the 60s stuff, like seeing Paul and Linda and George and Olivia in their home movies, you know, uh, and yeah. like all these people who were alive then and participating in real time. And even the ones from earlier, like Mal Evans, and there's just so many little callbacks to the past. The time between now and the anthology is longer than the time between the anthology and the Beatles. That's fucked up. <laughs> it was a really long time ago and it feels weird to think about That's that. really fucked up. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, forget that you said that. Um, but no, yeah, but I, I agree. I think that's really cool. And I think, you know, maybe now and then could have benefited more from having callbacks to more of the, you know, like Mel in there or Brian, just more little Easter eggs that Free the Bird and Real Love had. If we're going to compare videos, like Free the Bird for me is number one far and away mm -hmm. over both Real Love and Now and Then. It's some sort of perfection. 
you know, on yeah, some it level. Really is. I appreciate that Peter Jackson had done this video and that he was doing his first ever music video and all that. I do wish that because it was a Beatles project, they took a little bit more time with the technical aspects of it. Yeah. So it could match up with Free as a Bird. For sure. I mean, Free as a Bird, if you think about it, it uses a kind of AI, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the visuals that actually kind of comes out better than the now and then in some aspects. You know, um, I'm thinking specifically now and then video when, you know, some photographs are animated and mm -hmm. it's a little scary. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a little scary. The Free as a Bird, you know, sort of takes those elements but made them look real and mm -hmm. arted them up rather than try to make them look legit. There's just aspects that even for that time, top what Peter Jackson did on Now and Then. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was definitely something there was more time and more resources put in towards the video. And it was part of the anthology package. So they marketed it. It was something they were selling in a way, yeah. you know, and in, in a way that that they weren't for now and then. I just wish Ringo had gone into the studio to sing that with Paul. I mean, that would have made it like 50 percent better if they'd been in the same room instead of you seeing Ringo on a green screen in Paul's studio. I know oh, that would have been so nice. There are many things to critique in the now and then video. I, I guess, yeah, again, if we're specifically comparing these, I would rank it for me, Freeze Bird number one. I, I don't know. I, it's hard because I love things about the real love video. Maybe I put that as number two and then three would be now and then. Maybe. What would your order be? For both the song and the video, definitely Free as a Bird, though I'm torn. I feel like the now and then video might be number three but then now and then song would be number, number two. two yeah i i would agree with that actually that would be how mine would fall as well and i don't know if that would change once they put mal on the two older songs but hopefully we will see if you know giles gets to a 30th anniversary anthology uh, yeah remix. That, i i really I, I can't imagine that won't happen but i guess we can just have our fingers crossed yes for sure so that was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed great. looking back at that and kind of completing our our post breakup trilogy of songs. It was great. It was fun to dive into that because yeah, it really I, was. I don't know about you. I don't really think about that era of the Beatles much. So it was cool to like really immerse ourselves in it for for this week's episode. Yeah, and to watch some of the anthology, which I hadn't for a long time. When and it's really good. I mean, it's still so interesting to watch especially after many many years away from it yeah hopefully it gets a, a streaming release one of these days yeah maybe next year for the 30th anniversary on disney plus that would be great sidebar epi's meowing so if you hear him that's uh anyway oh i don't but i wish i did and last but not least thank you once again to george martin for the entertainment <laughs> this episode i appreciate it deeply oh my god <laughs> yes. Thank you for being the superstar of this episode. You were the yeah. sleeper hit here. See, you didn't even have to produce it to be the superstar right here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, he got his uh, he got his comeuppance finally on this podcast. He sure did. Anytime, <laughs> George Martin, anytime. Yes. <laughs> and thanks again for listening to BC The Beatles. As always, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, now YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. Please give us a rating and review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Yes, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X, and TikTok. We'll be posting photos and more from this episode and beyond. And remember, you can always email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com as well. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.